Hello, everyone. Welcome to our second webinar of Sequestration Week 2 on Regenerative Agriculture, Sequestering Carbon in Agricultural Soil. I'm Joe Wachunas here, as always, with my teammate, Brian Stewart. Uh, we'll introduce our panelists, uh, Dr. Tim LaSalle and Anthony Corsaro, in just a second. Uh, but just want to welcome you today and happy to have you with us. So uh, for those of you joining an Electrified Now webinar for the first time, we uh, are a all-volunteer all organization that believes in electrification as a primary strategy to decarbonize our lives and, and keep our climate livable. And we try to boil it down into a couple succinct points um, uh, that where all of us can take part in, in uh, electrifying uh, everything. So uh, number one is to clean up your electric supply through solar panels or community solar or ut utilities renewable energy program. Number two is electrify your home. Uh, we have a lot of videos on YouTube explaining exactly how to do that. Uh, number three is to electrify your transportation, your car or your bike. And then number four is to electrify everyone. We'll get to that in just a second. Huge thanks to our over 40 members of our uh, Electrify Coalition. These are uh, for-profits, non-profits, trade organizations that are uh, that believe in electrification as a, uh, a primary uh, avenue to respond to climate change. And um, we welcome all groups to join us. Please email Brian or I. You can find our uh, email addresses on electrifynow.net. Um, and uh, we'd love to have you as part of our coalition. Huge thank you to all the folks who have donated in previous webinars and in this webinar to our Electrify Everyone project. This is a project that we run with Community Energy Project. Uh, we raise funds so that uh, income qualified households can have free electric efficient heat pump water heaters installed in their house to replace their old inefficient fossil fuel gas water heaters. Uh, last year we raised $4,000 just through our webinars alone. We've installed 50 uh, heat pump water heaters. And I'll just say in sequestration week two, we're almost about up to about $600 uh, of funds raised so far, so thank you. And everyone who donates through Eventbrite uh, to uh, this project is entered into a raffle to win a book uh, called Climate Wise Landscaping. Um, we will be hearing from author Ginny Stiebelt uh, on Friday um, about how to uh, grow and sequester carbon in our own uh, gardens and yards. And so you're entered to win one of two books um, for that by donating. Okay, so we're on sequestration week two. If uh, Hopefully some of you have joined us uh, for our, a webinar yesterday um, on carbon sequestration, a big overview. It's on our YouTube page, just Google Electrify Now uh, YouTube. Uh, and you'll find on that, our YouTube page as well, sequestration week one from last year, where we covered a variety of topics uh, related to carbon sequestration. Um, we're so excited about the response that we always get to this, uh, this event and this week. Uh, this year, we've already had over 1,800 people register from 40 different countries. Um, if you feel comfortable and want to share where you're calling in from today or tonight, go ahead and put that in the chat. Uh, we'd love to hear about it. Um, and while uh, you're doing that, we're going to launch a poll to better understand our audience. Um, just asking, uh, you know, what is your interest in the top this topic? Where are you hailing from? Are you part of the general public, the agriculture industry, nonprofit, government, academia, or other? And while you're filling that out, um, let me just tell you about our remaining webinars uh, for this week. Tomorrow, we're going to be um, talking about direct air capture, pulling carbon dioxide directly from the air. Uh, on Thursday, we're going to be talking about oceans, uh, how to uh, possibly sequester carbon in the oceans. And then, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Friday, we're going to be talking about climate-wise climate landscaping, uh, sequestering carbon uh, in your own yard. Um, so please join us for all those. You can find them at, again, electrifynow.net, and I'll put a link in the chat as well. So Brian, do you want to uh, show the results of the, the poll? Great. So about 30% uh, from the general public. We have some folks from 17% from the agricultural industry, 20% from nonprofits, 13% uh, from government, a little bit from uh, academia, and then 16% from others. So thanks so much for sharing that great info. Uh, always curious to see how, who our audience is. Great. So Brian, tell us, why are we focusing on carbon sequestration this week? Thanks, Joe. And um, yeah, you know, this is a big topic, obviously, and that's why we devote a whole week to this conversation. But we like to start uh, our like lead into the specific topic that we have today, um, starting big picture just a little bit and reminding ourselves why this is such an issue and also reminding ourselves that, you know, before we even 
get to the topic of con uh, sequestration, it's always important to remind ourselves that the first priority is to stop producing man-made emissions as soon as possible. And uh, fossil fuels is the largest source. There's other ones, and we're going to be talking about some of those sources today. But burning fossil fuels is the number one source. And so normally in our webinars, we're talking about the solutions, the alternatives to burning fossil fuels for energy, clean renewable energy, EVs for transportation, heat pumps for um, heating our homes, etc. And so we, we've got a lot of webinars on that topic. But the truth is that even if we do a really good job at this, and obviously the sooner we do this, the less sequestration we will need. But even if we do a great job on this, there are going to be legacy emissions that remain in the atmosphere because we've been putting those uh, carbon emissions up there for literally hundreds of years. Um, scientists estimate that starting in year 2050, we will need to be removing 15 to five to 15 gigatons of CO2 every year for many years afterwards um, to sort of draw down these legacy carbons uh, emissions even after the point where we've got to net zero in terms of um, the creation of new emissions. So think about that, you know, by 2050, so we've got some time still to ramp up, but we are gonna need to be absorbing uh, and removing huge uh, quantities of emissions. And just to give you an idea about what five gigatons means, the United States last year produced about, or sorry, in 2020, produced about five gigatons. So this five to 15 tons that we're gonna be, need to be removing is a global number, but it pretty much is equivalent to what we've been producing here in the United States every year. So it's, it's daunting, but like I said, we've got 30 years to ramp up to this. Um, and obviously, like I said before, the faster we stop the, our current emissions, the closer it'll be to five rather than 15. Okay, so there's multiple ways of doing this. And this week we're diving into many of these. Um, we're not talking about forests this year, although we did uh, do a, a webinar on that last year. We're gonna be talking about agriculture today. We'll be talking about oceans on Thursday. Uh, we're not covering enhanced weathering. We touched on it briefly in the overview yesterday, but this is a really interesting topic. We'll probably devote a, a session to this on its own at some point. Last year we did industrial carbon capture and storage, and this year we're doing a, another webinar on direct air capture tomorrow if you're interested. Really fascinating and probably um, absolutely necessary technology at some point. But a lot of this, the, how much of each of these we need is really um, unknown right now. And in some degrees, it's unknown even what the potential is for each of these, but we're gonna be talking specifically about agriculture today. And there are a lot of um, estimations about what the potential for this are, and I'm super excited about our panelists because we're gonna dive into that topic. But just to lead us into this, consider this, that scientists ag agree that somewhere between 20 and 75% of agricultural land has lost, or sorry, agricultural lands has lost somewhere between 20 and 75% of its soil carbon. And in some cases, it's possibly higher than that. So. The, I, this is staggering because if you consider the, the huge acreage that's devoted to agricultural production and to think that that soil is, is lost a significant part, if not the majority of its carbon over the decades of uh, land management, that's a scary number. So one of the things we're gonna be talking about today is what is it that's led to this um, level of depletion in agricultural soil? What can we do to prevent that and rebuild the soil which would be carbon storage. And that gets you to this conversation of regenerative agriculture, which is our topic for today. And uh, we're gonna try to answer these and other questions. You know, what, is, what do we mean by regenerative agriculture? What is it? And what are the practices that sort of make farming regenerative? And why are these practices beneficial? Because there's a lot of benefits besides just the carbon storage that are important to, to know about. And then what is happening in the soil that makes these practices lead to more carbon capture and, and availability of carbon for, for plants? And then, you know, what is the potential? What do we think we might be able to get out of this technique? And, and how do we even measure it? Um, there's a lot of interesting work going on there that we'll be talking about. And then of course you have this question of how can it be scaled? Because without scaling, all, none of these um, solutions are very attractive if we can't scale them at a large, large scale. 
And then I think it's really interesting, and we'll be talking about this towards the end, about how all of us can participate in helping to support these uh, regenerative farming practices that have so much uh, potential and promise. So with that, I'm going to uh, introduce our speakers. We're gonna be starting with Dr. Timothy LaSalle. He's the co-founder of the California State Chico Center for Regenerative Agriculture and Resilient Systems. He was the first CEO of Rodale Institute. Some of you may know the Rodale Institute. They were um, fundamental in establishing organic um, standards and practices for farming. Uh, he's the executive, he was the executive director of the Allen Savory Center for Holistic Management and he was an advisor for the Howard Buffett Foundation in Africa on soils and food security for smallholder farmers. He's a professor emeritus at uh, Cal State um, Polytech in uh, California, and he's the former president and CEO of the California Agricultural Leadership Program, where he arranged educational leadership programs in more than 80 countries. So he's one of the leading um, experts on this topic of regenerative agriculture, and I would say is ahead of his field in general on this. And so super excited to have Dr. LaSalle here to talk with us today. And then we also have um, Anthony Corsaro, who is the Director of Business Development for Regenerative Food Systems Investment, which works to mobilize capital to support and grow regenerative food and agricultural projects. Anthony was a third generation family executive at Indianapolis Fruit Company that provided fresh produce products and services to over 2,500 retail customers across 20 states. So he has a really good understanding of the food distribution network, which is a critical piece of what we're going to be talking about today. And then his professional background in food distribution and personal health journey led him to his commitment of building regenerative food systems. And he's a, uh, an active investor and an entrepreneur in multiple regenerative food ventures, which we'll be hearing a little bit about today. So I'm excited about both of our speakers today. You couldn't ask for a better um, kind of cross-section from the sort of science background to uh, practical um, uh, insights into what's happening with, with industry in this area. So I, with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. LaSalle to share his screen and get us started. And while Dr. LaSalle is getting going, we'll just remind folks, uh, if you want to put questions for our panelists, uh, please use the Q&A button. Uh, the chat is easier to follow, just uh, you know, uh, discussion, but Q&A is great where we can access the, your questions. Well, thank you very much, uh, Brian and Joseph, uh, for the opportunity to present today uh, to your audience from really around the globe. And it's a delight to be here with Anthony, who is going to bring a really nice perspective to this overall discussion. One of the things that, that I do want to say to sort of uh, back up what Brian in his introduction brought forward is, is that we have continued to kind of destroy our soils. And this began a few years ago, I think they would say 10,000 years ago, when we started agriculture, we started to till the soil and we started to lose it and break it up. The biology has a, a, a way of aggregating and holding it together. But as we start to disturb it, then we create soil loss. Not just soil loss, but when the oxygen comes into the soil, what happens is the bacteria start to feed on the organic matter and a lot of carbon dioxide is released to the atmosphere. Therefore, if we look at what's in our air as far as excess CO2, soil is responsible for up to about 25% of that. And that's part of our legacy issue. It's often not talked about, but it's something that can be fixed almost immediately uh, if we turned our attention to it and changed the way we educate, train, and incentivize agriculture. It's really kind of uh, interesting to see that it's when we think in terms of our land use change, in other words, cutting forests down, we know we're supposed to stop that. Um, that's part because we know trees want to absorb a lot of carbon dioxide, but when we bear that soil, that's when you start to lose a lot of carbon dioxide out of it. And the other part is of course, tillage, just as I mentioned, it really adds oxygen, feeds bacteria, CO2 is lost. And then as we start to add a lot of chemicals that also starts to create imbalances and runs to more bacterial dominant soils, which again, starts to degrade the organic matter and turn it into CO2. You know, this comes to, as we sit here with this climate crisis that we're stare, staring us down right now, as far as what our future is, here's another crisis, just in case we don't feel like with the nuclear war threats today and with the COVID threats and, and now climate, of course, but we really have 
less than 60 years of topsoil left if we continue to farm the way we have farmed. And that is a rapid loss of topsoil that of course feeds our planet of 7.3 billion people. The upper left picture here is when I was in Africa with Howard Buffett's project there and, and I was running one on uh, specifically for smallholder farmers with no outside inputs, can we grow food? No tillage, so we don't destroy and lose soils. And that upper left-hand picture was a, a field right next to mine that I asked them to disc just one time to kill the weeds so that all those weed seeds wouldn't blow into my fields. And then a rain came. And then I felt terrible. Look at the erosion that took place that fast. The upper right-hand corner is a picture in Burundi where almost every inch of that country is hand tilled and not all the hills are that steep, but they were losing their soil rapidly. It's not just Africa. The field in the lower right-hand corner is my neighbor in Templeton where the county came with a big tractor and hauled his topsoil out of the county road because the rain had washed it to the county road. So we continue to destroy our soils and lose carbon through tillage. This is in Ghana where I was helping Kofi Boa with a, a research project and he had four different regions. This was in a more arid region and, and they had a shortage of rainfall this year. There's a plot of cowpeas in the back of this picture where the two gentlemen are standing and you can see cowpeas at the top of those plants. This is also a little plot of cowpeas in the front foreground of this picture that is this plant at the same time in the same soil with the same rain, everything is the same except the only treatment difference between these two plots is the front plot had been tilled as the way farmers have tilled that their fields forever. And the back field for this one time was not tilled. And see what happens when you start to let soil structure and therefore capacity to hold water and allow the roots to really gain access to a more um, a structured soil there was actually food versus a crop failure. So we have to change our understanding. And these are pictures of aggregation that take place. The center two jars in both of these pictures of three are where they're, they're both my soil. One was in my home little farm in Atascadero, California, where that center picture is aggregated soil. That actually picture is 10 days old. That soil held together in that water and didn't dissolve. Whereas, as you see on the far left, the same clawed size of soil all dissolved and, and washed, in other words, would wash away, wouldn't hold. In the right picture, that's from Africa and was very sandy soil. The center jar is my fields that were not tilled and that were biologically aggregated. Whereas the left jar really was the field right next that you just saw me show you a picture of that washed away because of one tillage uh, event where that aggregation was broken up and the erosion certainly took place. And in this case, it won't hold. And we don't have the air spaces in the soil in those cases for air to move through, for the biology and for the nitrogen to come into the system. Let's move away from the question about really aggregation at the moment. It's a crucial part of regenerative agriculture, but start to think in terms of this climate question. And I see Brian and Joseph, you're gonna have a, a, a conversation about carbon capture really from the air. You know, the plant that's now operationalized in Iceland uh, really could capture about 4,000 metric tons per year to really equate to all of the uh, emissions that we now currently are emitting in the planet. It means that we would need 2,325,000 of those plants at a cost of about $127 trillion. But if we go with the kinds of levels of carbon capture we're seeing, we'll only need about two thirds of the farmland. And if we were to pay farmers some incentive level of three, $400 an acre to, to capture carbon by changing to regenerative, that would be about 93 billion. And I think we should pay farmers to do that because I have carbon excesses. Who's gonna mitigate that for me? Farmers could, and we would get more productive, more resilient soil, better water holding capacity in the soil, more nutrient dense food because the biology brings the nutrients to the food. And we'd have improved water quality. We would reduce the flooding because the aggregation water percolates in that. We'd increase food security because we have a buffer to drought when we increase the carbon in the soil and we increase biodiversity. So I have less of an interest in, in mechanical capture and more into supporting the biology and the life of soil. 
these four farmers that I'm putting up here is really this paradigm change, a new lens. Let's take a new set of, of lenses and look at agriculture differently. We are doing a project in Wilcox, Arizona, and Doug Aller is the farm manager there, and Dr. Cindy Daly and I were just there last week, and we saw 10.8 tons of carbon per hectare per year, and I'll show you a, a chart, of, a, a little graph of that data. Russell Hedrick in North Carolina regeneratively is growing and finding eight and a half tons. Dr. David Johnson in New Mexico, in, in some fields there at the university, he got 10.7 tons as well of carbon per hectare per year. And Gabe Brown, who's written the book From Dirt to Soil, and he's here right now in, in Chico, actually presenting to a group of, of 50 people that have signed up for a class on regenerative ag. He had gotten 11.6 tons. And this is in essence what his learning process took him to. 93, he stopped tilling. Then he included crop diversity and you see the carbon start to increase in the soil. He added cover crops in the off season, again, a little bit more carbon. And then he added multi-species, which is a principle of regenerative agriculture, diversity, diversity, diversity. That's crucial to building the biology and life of the soil. And then he actually integrated livestock and got to this 11.6 tons. Well, what we see then is most of the literature in agriculture says you can get maybe a ton per hectare per year. And Rotan Lal, who runs a, a center at Ohio State on soil carbon capture, has told me, well, maybe a ton and a half if you add manure. And they are not, as these scientists and these soil scientists, brilliant people, don't understand the biological diverse process of what can happen. Those four farmers averages you see is a magnitude higher than what our conventional literature wants to say is possible in soil. It's why we are doing this research dramatically. Uh, I mean, so, so profoundly looking at what's happening and how much could we actually do if we regenerated these soils. What you're seeing in the short video clip is a root hair. And this root hair is providing its root exudates into that soil environment. What happens then is it is exudating sugars and carbohydrates. And why is it doing that? Because it wants to create a bartering system with the organisms in the soil. Dr. Christine Jones from Australia refers to this as the liquid carbon pathway. And what it, as it feeds the biology in its rhizosphere, in its root area, of fungi and bacteria and protozoa and amoeba through its sugars and carbohydrates that all of those organisms need, then those organisms begin to feed the plant. And it'll bring the, the kinds of nutrients that plant needs. And that's why we can do this farming without fertilizer. We can do it more productively and create a healthier system, as we said, capturing carbon. This is a picture of, of roots on the right that, um, one of the farmers that gave me this, he's, he's here local in California, he says, see my dreadlocks. And the point is, you see the roots with all of the, the soil stuck to it. It's because of the root exudates that came out and was feeding the biology. Whereas a plant on the left with fertilizer, you see white roots. So if you go out and pull up your plants and you're seeing white roots, you don't have a real active biological system going. If you pull up and have all this glue, gluey, gooey stuff holding onto the soil, you have a living system. The fungal network itself, the mycorrhizae fungi as an example, will insert itself into the root, bringing uh, micronutrients, bringing protein uh, or nitrogen, sometimes protein, but nitrogen, bringing water and helping this plant resist droughts or shortages of water while the plant feeds it sugars and carbohydrates. It can actually increase the root surface area of a plant by 50 times. So no wonder it can get more nutrients and more water if it needs it in, in drought short areas when that healthy biology is really working. At Jena, at Jena uh, University in Germany, they found that as you increase plant biodiversity and species in the soil, you increase the amount of carbon that's captured, you increase the amount of nitrogen that's available to the plants. So as you get up to like 16 plant species, you can get up to 200 pounds of nitrogen being stored in that soil with over 22% more carbon. This is a picture that Christine Jones shared with me in, in Canada during a drought season. The picture on the left shows a single species of triticale and butted up against 
of this field that has multi-species where the triticale is also growing much more robustly in a multi-species uh, plant. So we think in terms of monoculturing crops, but look at in a rain short year, this multi-species, you would have more triticale coming out. And if you wanted any of those other crops for hay or whatever, you have so much more production. But look at, we always say, well, you don't want too many plants out there because the water shortage. This was a water short year. And look at what happens with diversity and the ability to store water and share water in those systems. I just show you, is, is this profitable? And the reason I show this in, in this Wilcox project in yield, farmers like to talk about yield, in a conventional system with 256 pounds of nitrogen fertilizer to grow this corn, they got 217 bushels where we cut that to only 15% fertilizer, but had this multi-species cover crop as a source of nutrients that was grown in the winter, it became a source of nutrients for the plant during the summer as it broke down and the biology made it available. They got the same amount of production and no fertilizer was 203 bushels. When you come to profit, you've saved all the money. And therefore in that 15% fertilizer it was $121 increased income. And that's part of what we're trying to show how regenerative and building that health of the soil can be more profitable for farmers. Here it was in the next year with, with uh, pinto beans. Again, with the low fertilizer level, that was the most profitable. And with no fertilizer it was nearly as profitable. Whereas with the full fertilizer regime that the agronomists would say would tell us those plants needed, they basically broke even. So we know building health and diversity and changing, this is what happens, our soils from bacterial dominant to our conventional systems to fungal dominant through our um, change in the way we are treating the soils by doing cover crops, getting multi-species diversity in the off season, and then growing your cash crops, you move to a fungal dominant, highly productive, biologically healthy system. And, and then this is what happened in Arizona. In the years they were doing no till, they actually were not tilling, they were starting to gain a little bit of carbon. But in 2019, in this chart, we started this regenerative approach by adding the multi-species cover in the off season and the carbon levels jumped. That carbon no longer lives in the atmosphere, it lives in the soil. And Brian, I'm saying this lives as a different way to look at soil carbon instead of sequestered. And sequestered can be a dead carbon. We're not interested in a dead carbon in the soil because the living system has a carbon cycle. All we wanna do is accrue, take more out of the atmosphere, grow it back in the soil from what it used to be. And we know how it's done. This young lady surprised me as she tattooed on her arm the secret message of using solar panels of the plant, their leaves, and converting that energy, capturing that solar energy, and, and bringing in, the leaves will take in the carbon dioxide with the water and the sunlight, make carbohydrates and release oxygen to us. And that's the solar panel that will save us. Uh, Howard Buffett, who I'd worked with in Africa, said we got to get away from the idea of a green revolution with chemical inputs and soil destruction to a brown revolution where we invest in the soil. In my work in Africa and South Africa, I was able to show with no outside inputs increased yields. That was all through building that soil health, the biology, the diversity, and therefore the soil carbon. Regenerative agriculture describes farming and grazing practices that among other benefits, reverse climate change by rebuilding soil organic matter and restoring degraded soil biodiversity, resulting in both carbon drawdown and improving the water cycles. It can even happen in grazing land, like in Sonora Desert, where one began to graze his cattle differently in a holistic management approach, rotational, high intensive, high impact, short time moving it from a desert to a grasslands, returning it actually to a grasslands and capturing carbon. Do you know if we treated our soils as a living system, fed the biology and did not abuse it or leave it bare, we could actually go back to our pre-industrial levels. There is enough good farmland and rangeland and forests that we could return to, that we could actually draw down all of our current emissions but it means huge changes in, in consciousness, in policy, and in education. 
obviously the only reason I'm back in a university system, I'm not directly working for a university, but working with it at our center is that we do need the data and we're bringing that forward to help people understand the potential that soil brings to begin to correct a rather large mistake of digging up that buried carbon and releasing it into the atmosphere. We have a new project and, and I'll put it in the chat um, that's called the Soil Carbon Accrual Project that we're gonna start in five states. And our effort is going to be to monitor regenerative alongside conventional and tr track that carbon dioxide with flux towers, with NASA uh, uh, satellite data, with direct soil carbon measurements as well. So uh, we look forward to your questions later. And with that, Brian, thank you very much for the opportunity to share this. That was fantastic. Thank you, Tim. Um, Anthony, go ahead and queue up your slides. Wow, uh, that was amazing. We've got a lot of good questions. And um, I think I'm gonna wait, we're gonna do a QA and a section at the end and because some of your questions might get answered by Anthony's presentation, um, but we'll, we'll make sure we'll try to pick off as many of them as we can towards the end, so, so stay tuned. And take it away, Anthony. Cool. Great to be with all of you, Brian, Joe, thank you for the invite and the lovely intro. It's an honor to follow after uh, Dr. LaSalle and just be connected to his work in, in some way because people that are doing the, the work that he's doing are, are the most important to drive in this change. So it's just great to see. Um, I want to start with, you know, as consumers and investors, which is really the space that, I, that I'm going to cover, why should we care, right? And the reasons we should care is the reasons on this, this screen right now, human health, environmental health, economic health, racial justice, food access, food security, national security, rural viability, climate change. I mean, if you care about any of these issues, you should care about regenerative agriculture. So Doc gave a little bit about his background. Who, who am I, who are, who are you talking to today? Uh, my journey is both on the food distribution side, like Brian said, and with a personal health you know, crisis and autoimmune disease. And that really led me to be really passionate, passionate and curious about regenerative agriculture. Um, and having been in food so long, you know, and not knowing about it, I almost had had a guilt that that really sparked into this lovely curiosity. And what brought me to it originally was I had tried a lot of things to reverse or not have symptoms of my disease and nothing worked until I fixed my food. Nothing worked until I embraced food as medicine. And I really was, um, you know, imperative on what I ate, where it came from and how it was produced. And so that's my my emotional connection to the space. What I do today in the space, um, Brian talks a little bit about it, but to give you some more color there, regenerative food systems investment, uh, it's a great platform started by a lovely lady named Sarah Day Levesque. And what we do is really connect the capital allocators and the capital activators to the people that are investing and the people that are getting invested in. And we do media content and events to bring them together and to help invest and grow the space as fast as possible to get the money and the capital behind all these great ideas, all this great research and all this action that needs to be taken. Regeneration Nation is a sustainable clothing apparel brand that promotes regenerative ag and donates money to nonprofits. And then Outlaw Ventures is a family office investing vehicle that works across food and ag to invest in, yes, things that can provide substantial return, but also have to have a positive impact on human and environmental health. So really gonna talk about three things today, regen, re, regen education, regen consumption, and regen investment and try to design my content so everyone could leave with some real nuggets that they could absorb, understand, easy to get, easy to actionize, um, but also some resources that you can take the learning further uh, if you would so, so choose. And some people have already kind of been asking for that in the chat, so that's great. Um, I am an expert generalist of the space, so I know a lot about a lot, and I know a lot about the high level macro view of kind of what's going on with, with things across the landscape. Um, and then lastly, this information is supposed to meet people where they are, you know, whether it's your first time hearing the term regenerative agriculture or the thousandth time, we have a little bit of stuff in here for kind of beginners, intermediates, and, and experts, hopefully. So saw these already mentioned in the chat, but baseline beginner stuff. If you haven't seen these two movies, go watch them. If you want to know what regenerative agriculture is and you want to have a really cool uh, picture of them. And if you want to leave fired up about regen ag, go watch uh, both of these movies, Kiss the Ground and The Biggest Little Farm. Next, we had people looking for book recommendations. There's, there's a ton. 
Um, I picked out I picked out these three for a specific reason. Uh, Doc mentioned Gabe Brown. He's kind of the the poster child for Regen Ag at this point. So this is his personal journey from degenerative, unprofitable, you know, failing farm to regenerative poster child farm um, where he's at in the Dakotas. Dan Barber is a famous chef, and so he brings in kind of that chef foodie lens uh, to talk about how we how what we eat today is different than what we used to eat, how it needs to change, why sustainable local regenerative food is really important to him as a chef, and then. Last but probably most important and, and certainly most important is braiding sweetgrass. This brings in the indigenous perspective because it's important to say regenerative agriculture is indigenous agriculture. And a lot of what we do today is just returning to uh, indigenous practices and philosophies that we neglected as we kind of transition into the industrial age. So it's important to give them the proper credit and acknowledgement and um, braiding sweetgrass is an awesome book that kind of brings in that lens as well. Uh, the Rodale Institute, the Savory Institute have already been mentioned, but if you want to kind of follow some nonprofits that uh, are really reputable in the space, definitely check out these four folks. I could pick out a lot, but these are, are four of my favorites. Check out their website, subscribe to their newsletters, follow them on social. They all do different things across the space, but it's kind of a good little four piece starter pack uh, if you want to follow some nonprofits that are doing great work in the space. So consumption and investment. Um, the, the short story here is there's a ton of momentum. Uh, I saw somebody ask a question about General Mills already. Um, I could have pulled 200 headlines like this, but the, the short story here is big food and ag knows what regenerative is. They're trying to do stuff about it. And a lot of them are making commitments. Um, and you can kind of see that in this next slide, which is a little pixelated, but these are the who's who of big food and ag companies. PepsiCo, General Mills, Cargill, Walmart. I mean, I won't read the whole list, but I mean, these are the who's who of big food and ag. Um, and so this is great that this momentum, this, this, this action uh, is all being taken. But I think the two things to kind of note and follow are, we've seen promises from companies like this before on other topics that were unfulfilled or, or not fulfilled properly. So will these companies actually make system-wide changes that are truly regenerative? Or will they turn regenerative into another meaningless buzzword like sustainable is now that gets thrown on, you know, a consumer package, good package, and it means nothing. Um, so awesome momentum, but we got to hold these folks accountable to actually doing stuff that really matters, that has real lasting change and, and has system wide change. So what can you do as a consumer? Um, there's a lot of debate on this topic. I mean, like, like Doc said, policy is so important. The, the markets are so important. There, there's so many things that really are huge move the needle topics in the space. And what I'll say about the efficacy of consumption is no matter what, if we produce a market for these, for these foods and we create more demand for them, that can only be a positive. And it's something that everyone on this call can, can do. So I would say it is pretty important. Um, and it, it lets us all take ownership to not pass the buck to somebody else to solve the problem. So we do need intervention across all those other categories, but consumption is a big piece for me. And I think about that in three real buckets, right? So local direct to consumer, think farmer's market, local grocery, your trip to the grocery store, or other retailers in your, in your neighborhood. And then nationally, you can buy from, you know, direct to consumer operators online and things of that nature. So especially when you're talking about limiting, um, the carbon footprint of what you eat from a food miles coming from that distribution space. I mean, in the produce side of things, most of what we eat in this country gets shipped from California to other parts of the country. So when you opt for local, that's always better from the carbon footprint on a distribution side. Not all local food is regenerative, so that's very important to note. But what I encourage you to do is, is check out your local farmer's market, check out these other four resources here. They have lists and directories and sortable things where you can find local producers in your area uh, and ask people or, or do your own research on their website or whatever on their social media. What, what are their production practices? Um, do they believe in regenerative? What do they think it means? What do they actually do to produce the food that, that they're trying to sell you? Um, and then take some ownership of knowing that information and, and acting accordingly. When you think about going to the grocery store or buying some stuff online, you really have to rely on third party certifications. So this one on the left is the one that the Rodale Institute in Patagonia and Dr. Bronner's and some others have put together. This one on the right is one that the Savory Institute has really led and brands like Applegate and Uggs on the fashion side are a part of. So these folks have websites, they have lists of people that they work with. 
All this means is that a third party has put money and time and energy into defining what they think regenerative is, and they want to certify or verify that these folks have done that through a set of practices or a set of outcomes. Um, the, the certification space is, is getting a little crowded. We had these two kind of in the center announced last week. Um, but I would say overall, all the energy and effort in that space right now is a good thing because consumers still do want a simple moniker to associate certain things with their food to make purchasing decisions, to make things simple as a consumer. Um, the biggest hurdle right now on the consumption side, if you listen to some of the, the food executives talk is really teaching them what regenerative means. A lot of people on this call probably knows what it means, but the average consumer does not. Uh, they're more familiar with the term sustainability. They're more familiar with the term climate change, right? So educating them on what it means to then follow up with the certification or the verification will be key. Um, and it'll be interesting to see, you know, we're, we're new into the certification space. So who really wins out and, and what really gets adopted at scale and, and what becomes the best tool for farmers, processors, distributors, consumers, kind of all across the, the food and ag landscape. But long story short here is if you're looking for stuff to buy at the grocery store online, use these certifications as a guide because it means somebody has put, put their stamp on it that they think it's regenerative. So regen investment, got to start off by saying, you know, this is not investment advice, do your own research, all investments have risk, seek counsel before making a decision, all those classic kind of things. But there's really four big buckets of capital allocation in the space. Loans, equity investments, grants, and ecosystem services. And we'll cover all four a little bit at a high level. So on the loan side, think about buying your house with a mortgage or you know, leasing a car, right? Or buying a car with a note. Um, people, farmers, operators are buying land, right? They're mortgaging land. They're taking out operating capital, like, hey, I need to buy everything that I'm using to produce my crop this year. Transition finance might be like Doc mentioned with cover crops. I want to transition to regenerative, so I have to do cover crops now. That's an additional $10 an acre. I might take out a loan to do that. And then big capital expenditures. So that's people buying a new tractor or a new piece of equipment that's very expensive. So can talk about more of this in Q&A and what this looks like. But if you want to put your money to work today, um, you can check out these two folks on this slide. Whether you're an accredited investor, whether you're not an accredited investor, they're doing really cool stuff on the crowd lending side and on the banking side. Uh, Walden Mutual, I don't think is operational yet. They're trying to get their charter, but these are both two folks that if you're passionate about regenerative sustainable agriculture, you can put your dollar to work no matter what kind of investor you are as determined by the SEC. Uh, equity investments is the next, bu the next bucket. Um, really think people invest in things that they will eventually sell in this bucket. That's a good, simple way to explain it. So you have people pooling funds to buy big pieces of land that they make money off of from the cash rent or from the actual output that they sell with the farmer. Um, and obviously that, event, that, that land's going to go up in value, then they'll eventually sell it later for a profit. That's more on the private equity land fund side. And then you have a lot of venture capital activity going into technology and consumer brands. And what they want to do is get in at an early stage with these early companies, grow them to a significant amount of, of revenue or, or profit, and then sell them to an acquirer, especially on the consumer brand side, because if they're going to meet these commitments that we've already shown you, what they're going to have to do is clean up their dirty food portfolios. These foods that have a worse carbon footprint, that are worse for human health, you, you're going to see the leaders de divest and sell off those assets and buy upcoming brands that are regenerative, are, are carbon neutral, are better for human health. And so these are a couple of players in this space. We've even seen big NGOs like the Nature Conservancy come in and start investing VC dollars, which is pretty wild, but, but pretty cool as well. Um, SLM Partners is, is one of the longest tenured, most reputable regenerative land managers around. And then Trailhead Capital is, uh, is about a year or so old, and they have a really cool venture capital thesis around tech and consumer brands and other things with a soil health lens. Grants are the third bucket. Um, the, the two easiest ones here are philanthropy and government. So there's a lot of foundations and other phil philanthropists that give out grants, which is basically money you don't have to pay back. And the government is the biggest source of grants in agriculture in our country. So the USDA itself, and there's even whole venture-backed companies like FarmRaise that help farmers apply for these grants, sort through the vast amount of them, figure out which one's right for them, figure out how to maximize the, the utilization of them. 
Um, and so grants are a huge piece. And we've just seen the USDA put out a proposal for a billion dollars of climate smart commodities, which is kind of their word for, for, for regenerative ag in a way. Um, and so this, this current uh, administration is, is doing some, some really cool things in terms of climate change and agriculture and, and climate smart agriculture. I threw Landcor up on here. They're a nonprofit that does a lot of research in the policy side and policy is a huge, huge lever that we need to pull and change to, to scale regenerative ag and incentivize farmers to do it. Um, so if you wanna know more on the policy side, check them out, go to their website, follow their newsletter. They're doing a bunch of stuff for the upcoming farm bill and they even make it really easy to kind of contact your local representatives and take some action. So I love what they're doing. So <laughs> this is my least favorite slide of the four um, and probably one that most people are the most interested. And I say it's my least favorite because I know the least about it because the world knows the least about it because it's the most debated and contentious of the four. The other three financial mechanisms have been around a lot longer. They're more established. The, the rules and the playbooks and the ROIs are, are much more clear and known. Um, how I approach ecosystem services markets as an investor myself is that I don't make investments purely off of them. I look at them as you know, the, the toppings on an ice cream sundae, but not the ice cream itself. So if there's potential for there to be revenue or for it to be a good investment based off ecosystem services, if that's in addition to another good business case, hey, that's great, that's extra, but I'm not banking on them just yet because they're really not established. Um, however, there's a ton of really smart people and a ton of big money going into the space to kind of figure that out. The, the biggest issues as to why they're not ironed out right now is there's a policy piece for sure. Um, and then secondly, the incentives and the adoption to get the farmers to do it aren't there yet. Um, it's like less than 1% or at most 1% of farmers are using these programs and trading in these, in these markets, right? So this is where they're getting compensated for what they're doing to help with carbon sequestration, cleaning up water and waterways, biodiversity, things of that nature. Um, and right now, the biggest hurdle there is the MRV, which stands for measurement, recording and verification. It's still very complex the scale technology to do it is not there. So it costs a lot of money. So produ to produce one carbon credit right now, 75% of that cost is the MRV. So we have to get that cost way down to make these viable. And I'm sure Doc has some very interesting thoughts on the farmer side and he'd be a better source there. And I'm interested to hear what he says from a farmer perspective. But basically the thesis is here is that this is another tool to incentivize farmers to practice better agriculture. Um, and put money in their pocket for, for, for doing so. So another investment disclaimer, but that's, that's all I got and uh, excited for Q&A and happy to be with all of you. Thank you, that was fantastic, Anthony, wow. Uh, okay, so we're gonna, we got about, we, we can probably go a little bit over, over the hour here and, and those of you can stick with us, stick with us. We'll, we'll, we'll uh, try to capture as many of these questions as possible. There are a lot of questions we had, it's a lot of energy. So thank you all for, for your questions. I'm gonna try to kind of um, do my best to, to bring some of them to our panelists attention. I wanted to start with, um, where should we start? Okay, actually, I want to start with a might be a kind of a simple one because I know that there's you know we've been talking about the Rodale Institute, for example, um, and uh, Dr. LaSalle was uh, director of that organization for a while, so very familiar with that group. But I think the Rodale Institute basically established this organic standard for um, organic farming. Can you just describe for us a little bit the difference between what we mean by organic farming and and regenerative farming? What how, how, do, what, how are those things, what's similar about them and what's different about them? Yeah, uh, for, so I came from conventional ag, which was definitely not regenerative and was chemicalized. And that was what I was trained, what I grew up with. I eventually saw the degradation of soils around the world. I got pulled more towards with Savory Center on grazing and stopping the spread of deserts, doing that very differently. And then eventually at Rodale, which was how do we get the chemicals out and the toxins out and stop creating dead zones in the in the ocean. But at that time, Rodale was still tilling. And that was in 2007 through, through about 2010-11. Um, when I went to Africa with Howard Buffett to try and combine the two, how do you stop bringing in the chemicals and how do you not till? Uh, which organic hadn't figured out at that stage. I've met some farmers since then in the last few years that have been able to really help perfect that. And I know Rodale has started to move more towards that. 
But what happens is you can't be regenerative. You can have organic soils that are less healthy for the plant than conventional soils, particularly if they've been tilled and tilled and tilled and tilled, you can destroy that biology so the nutrients aren't coming to the plant. You can have conventional soils have too many chemicals that can do the same thing, destroy that biology. So the point is, is how do you bring it all together? And the reason we don't use the word organic in our regenerative research and our regenerative work is we wanna reach the 99% of the farmers that aren't organic. And we know regeneratively, we can get rid of so many chemicals out if we sort of have that organic view, which we do, but we don't talk about it because a lot of farmers don't want, don't like that word organic. They feel beat up upon, et cetera. We want to talk to them about their profit and building soil health over time. What they'll find out, like Gabe Brown, who's here, as I said today, would say, he says, I like to sign the back of the check, not the front of the check. They'll find out they don't have to be writing these checks to the chemical companies because they're building the health of the system. And then we've got them, we've got them hooked into thinking again, how do I build this soil? Uh, and how do I stop paying salesmen? And so pretty soon salesmen aren't even welcome on their farm. They just don't need it anymore. So some end up organic by default. That's just not where they were headed, but they get there. And that, that's where our work is, is not to push it, not to push organic or shove it, but push soil health and and profit some of them are climate deniers and you'd think i don't want to go to dinner with them but i do want to convert them yeah. because while they go to bed at night they're going to be capturing carbon so you know that builds the health of their soil so it's a matter of language and how do we communicate with each other and get to the the points where we need to be building a future instead of destroying it i, I love that and i want to build on that a little bit and, and anthony maybe this is a question for you along that same line so I think, you know, what I love about this, the, the kind of strain that runs through the regenerative agriculture story is, you know, like farmers as like heroes instead of thinking of them as villains, you know, because I think there's a lot of one can get um, uh, develop this point of view that the farmers, man, if they would just do it, if they wouldn't do, do it that way, they do it this way, we'd be set. But, you know, farmers are are suffering in this country and um I think one of the things I'd love you to maybe comment on a little bit, Anthony, is what you feel about the opportunity of this regenerative kind of these regenerative practices and this theory to make farmers, you know, happier and more productive and um, more economically uh, sound. And, you know, it, it just, you know, we people are it's, it's hard to get people to want to be farmers right now. Right. Is what I'm hearing. So can you just comment a little bit about that, Anthony? Yeah, it's a super nuanced topic, but the, the, the short of it is, is that pretty much most of the economics and incentive structures that we have today are created to make farmers degenerative, right? Because maximizing profitability right now is incentivized by, by, doing, by being bad actors. So it's really not cool to vilify the farmers because they're just doing what they would do for their best self-interest like any of us would do at our jobs. Um, but they do have a unique responsibility since what they do does affect so many people. So there's there's kind of a, a double-edged sword there, but that's really why we need so much intervention on the policy side and in the financial markets, because we have to shift the, the, the incentive structures and the economics so that's in their best self-interest to, to be regenerative. And we're beginning to see that and we're beginning to see people prove that. If you read Gabe Brown's book, if, you know, in Doc's slides, he talks about profitability versus, you know, it, versus um, ha having a higher revenue and a higher yield, right? So like your yield and, and your revenue might drop. It might not with regenerative too, um, but ultimately you will be more profitable because you're not a slave to the inputs and the other things to basically create the chemistry and the biology that you need to produce the food. It's happening naturally because you're, you're stewarding the, the land in the appropriate way. Yeah, I love that. Uh, another topic that's sort of related to that, that I wanted to touch, dig into a little bit more. Um, you, you had mentioned, uh, Anthony, this notion of food as medicine and in, in your personal journey through um, uh, your autoimmune um, disease. And, you know, I, I have my wife has suffered from the, some of the same issues and, and has gone on a similar journey in, in a way into this exact place where food is such a critical part of human health. And, and it's so easy to um, kind of uh have a reductionist approach to this where you say like if it's got vitamins in it it's good which is you know like so not capturing the whole story of nutrition 
And so I'd love both of you to maybe talk a little bit about this, you know, the relationship between regenerative agriculture and food nutrition, um, and then of course human health. But can you, it's a deep topic, I know, so we could probably talk about that forever, but maybe you could just um, give us some, some, some of your thoughts on that. Yeah. Why don't you start, Anthony, and then I'd love to hear, um, Tim, you, you have... Just, just like the research and the data that we need on the on-farm carbon sequestration and positive outcome side, we need that on the nutrient density and the food side. And it's happening. There was a kind of a micro study just released last week that, that basically their findings were regenerative food is more nutrient dense. There is more of these most important phyto, phytochemicals, phytonutrients in the food than conventionally grown food. So that'll be a big piece to watch and, and really one thing I'm super passionate about is, is meat and beef and how it's been vilified. And, and basically we've, we've, we've taken this myopic view of all meat is bad and all meat is not bad. If you study ecology and you know anything about ecology, you know that migratory bison and elk and other ruminant animals grazed 80, 90% of this country before we colonized it. So we need that animal impact. We just need it done in the correct way. We need them pulled out of the feedlots. So me, the best climate eaters are the people that are actually eating climate neutral, climate positive beef, which is the most, you know, is the, is the worst food. Um, so that's from a climate perspective and a human health perspective. And the, the data is going to come that shows the nutrient density and the positive health outcomes. All I can report is my personal experiences, which is I feel so much better. I am so much better. My, my symptoms are gone when I eat these foods versus, you know, what else is available to me. So uh, Anthony's testimonial there is crucial, and, and the data is coming, and Gabe Brown uh, will tell you that his meat, that he's looking at poultry or eggs or, or beef, is higher nutrient dense, and he's had it measured. Alan Williams is here too. He's also had his beef measured, and it's pasture-based, it's holistically managed and grazing. And I'm almost 100% a, almost a vegetarian, and, and I'm still very much a proponent uh, because animals are a part of the whole system. Grass has evolved uh, with ant, with ruminants and the mycorrhizae fungi. The three of them work together, and that's a complex relationship which we, we could talk about. But in the nutrient density world, there's been a lot of controversy because most science is reductionistic and it's not looking at the whole picture. So in this soil carbon accrual project that I, I put the linkage in that we're going to do, we're going to not just take the CO2 loss from the soil and what's gained in the soil in the two different systems, conventional ag and regenerative. We're also going to measure water holding capacity, water efficiency use. We're going to also look at such things as nutrient density of the food that comes off those farms to be able to start to add that data into the scientific base of this discussion. David Montgomery and his wife Ann Bilkey is, have just published a book because he went out, to, he was here in Chico for a presentation, we spent some time with him. We were trying to help get funding to do wider side-by-side -side studies. And he doesn't have enough data to make it statistically significant, but he spent some time with 10 regenerative farmers versus conventional. And his book is just out now. I'm sorry, I don't re recall the title of it, but it is discussing this. What comes to it is I like to sort of use the pun. If we think in terms of the living microorganisms producing nutrients for the plant, transporting nutrients to the plant, finding micro minerals and bringing it to the plant, the plant's healthier, the food's healthier. It's just biological. Anyway, it's a logical thing to think <laughs> about. So, and biology has brought it to us. I mean, I've heard these sound bites like, uh, you know, like a a carrot today has something like one tenth of the nutrition of a carrot from 50 years ago or something like that, which I think is a testament to this kind of reductionist approach we've taken to agriculture and food in general. Um, and the, this, this complexity that, that, that we're just beginning to understand in many ways about um, all these interactions that happen down under belief the soil end up in the food that we eat, which ends up either making us healthy or, or not, depending on what we consume. I think I'm a huge believer in that. I want to touch on the animal thing because I know this is a hot button for a lot of people. It is for me, um, it, but in a different way for most people, because I think that there's a lot of just assumption that, you know, like part of climate change is getting rid of beef, which is I couldn't believe that I, to me, that's just so off base. But it's it's it really has to do with how we raise animals, not whether we raise them or not, because as you've both pointed out, you know, most of the ecosystems that have developed around the world developed in conjunction with large ruminant animals here in the United States, all this 
hugely deep topsoil that we had all across the Midwest was as a result of the grazing that happened there with, with bison and elk and other large ruminants. So I also remember in one of the slides you showed there was that uh, uh, Gabe's farm where he had done these various things, no-till and then um, cover crops, loss, of, you know, getting rid of fertilizer, the multi-species cover crop. And then it, there's this big kick at the end when he integrated animals. Can you speak a little bit to that, like what that really means in practice? And, you know, I have some questions about scalability there too, but what does that mean? And are you going to be touching on that with your study that you mentioned? Well, one of the good news things is good news from my perspective is, is in the study that we did on Howard Buffett's farm in, in Arizona is, is that we had no animals involved and yet we got the same level of capture that Gabe got. Uh, what Gabe's doing is he's giving himself some insurance with animals in that land. Some of that land's not farmable from the standpoint there's big stones in the field and he can't, couldn't get equipment in to plant seeds anyway, but he can, he can move animals through the system. Um, so, but what do animals bring into a system? So what happens when they bite the plant and, and pull some of the plant away, the plant is shocked and, and it sends out messages and it starts to push exudates to feed the biology to regrow itself. So it's been shocked into responding and wanting to regrow. That means more carbon capture. That means building that soil. So the, the animal's given a, a stimulus to the system. It brings biology and, and we're, I can't tell you how much that helps, but we're sure it helps. So the manure that gets stirred into the system is important. Uh, if you do a holistic planned AMP grazing, as they call multi paddock, where you intensely pack them like buffalo herds used to be, because the predators kept them packed together like they do in Africa, large wildebeest herds all together because of the predators, they stomp and they're, they're breaking parts of the plant off and it falls to the ground and becomes organic matter. The plant gets stimulated too, to grow more. The, the, the predators, whatever, move them off and they're, they're gone maybe for a year and all that grows back. So that's part of the stimulus. The other part here with animals in a system is, and Christine Jones told me this once, uh, I was driving her up to another event here in Northern California, and she says, do you know what works better than the, the root growth stimulating hormone that you buy at the nursery? If you make a cutting of your plant, you dip that cutting in to start the root and then plant it in your potting soil and the roots come out of that new cutting. She says, what works better than that is human saliva. The biology in the human saliva, well, the same thing happens with animals. The saliva on the plant adds to the biology of the whole system. When animals move through a landscape, the biology in that landscape has been shifted. And what we're seeing is in a very positive way because that's the whole system. That's how creation works in the most robust way, it seems. So it's important. We're seeing them being used, sheep are being used in vineyards are being used in orchards. Um, this grazing, you never wanna take more than 40% of your grasses or your what you're grazing and you wanna leave 60% and get them off. Don't graze it down to golf course level the roots also shrink to that same level and you're not building that soil. So you, you do not overgraze. Problematically globally, as humans, we've been overgrazing for 10,000 years and destroying landscapes. Mm -hmm. So we have to manage that grazing and the whole ecosystem jumps. Gotcha. Um, I wanna to touch back, um, get back to the topic of um, kind of carbon storage and measurement a little bit here. And I know this is another complicated one, but so uh, I get mentally, I, I can understand this picture that through these practices, more carbon is drawn from the atmosphere in a way and it ends up being kind of stored at least um, transiently in the soil. And so the soil, it's, it's there in the soil, it's living carbon, as you mentioned, instead of dead. So it's, it's there, but it can be re-released if practices stop or, or whatever, but it also continued to grow. Um, and, but I guess one of my questions is, you know, you were mentioning these numbers like, um, you know, as much as 10 tons per hectare per year. Um, how do you have an idea about, let's say that you had a farm that was doing that, was just generating 10 tons and, you know, 10 years from now, could it still be adding 10 tons per year? Or at some point do you get to a point where the soil is like absorbed as much as it can? Do you have a sense? Maybe. Of we don't know totally, but here's one of the, the, the constrictions in our thinking. One is we believe that here's a soil, it's like a bathtub. And when we fill it up with carbon, that's it and it won't take any more. What we, we're not thinking about is, uh, and, and one of the people that taught us this was Charles Darwin. 
his best-selling book was not about evolution. His best-selling book was about earthworms. And then in essence, he had left home to go on one of his ventures, left home knowing he had all these stones out in his paddock. He came home after his long travel and the stones were gone. He wondered who took them, but he went on dig, dug around. Nobody took them, the earthworms buried them. So we can grow soil. That's those deep soils you were talking about, Brian, in the Midwest, which means we're increasing the size of that bathtub. The other thing is, as you get multi-species and some deep rooted things and the biology going down with those roots, as you open that soil up and you demineralize the rock, the bedrock below, you can deepen the soils. So any talk about plateauing uh, carbon in the soil doesn't really understand we can grow the soil. Mm -hmm. And in most soils, we're not close to plateauing anyway, even if there was some level of constriction. We can create more, build more, and we're so far away from that question that it's almost not relevant yet. I hope it gets relevant someday, but not my lifetime. I idea though, of building the soil, because I remember, you know, hearing that, you know, that in fact, I, I think in, in one of our webinars we did last year, someone was showing a picture of, of, of the, the, actually how the, the level of the land had gone down, I mean, visibly gone down just in the last few decades. Yeah. The soil erosion and soil Absolutely. depletion, you know, various forms of soil depletion. So you could reverse that potentially. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. That's, that's awesome. Um, Anthony, you would, you would, we were talking a little bit about carbon markets and, you know, I'm really fascinated by this because, you know, I'm hopeful that the carbon markets can help be a positive influence on, um, you know, jumpstarting and per perpetuating these practices that we're talking about. And you had mentioned that one of the questions was around measurement and verification. So um, what are we seeing there? I can understand how that's complicated. You know, I know in the, in, in the case of trees, you can sort of measure the girth of a tree and get a pretty good idea for how much carbon is there. And you measure enough trees in a forest, you get a pretty good idea how, of what the carbon is now compared to was when you did those me measurements 10 years ago. With soil, how does it how do we even do this this kind of soil carbon measurement and um and what what's what's anything that we're seeing out there that's going to make the, the cost of that go get lower uh it's a very debated topic um doc might have some thoughts on it as well but there's people trying to do basically two things actual soil sampling uh in various different ways and then satellites and remote sensing to gauge these same outcomes or practices and so there's basically an arms race to kind of build one of those or a combination of those that gets you the, the models or extrapolations that you want with the ground truth data that proves it or proves it at a high enough percentile, 90, 95, 99, whatever the market kind of deems uh, is acceptable. I think the, the things to just be wary of there are, do we really need to monetize nature in another way, right? So. We have we, we just have a tug of war going on between we have to incentivize the farmers and we have to we have to uh, incentivize and give positive reinforcement to the good actors right but it's just a slippery slope of are we going to monetize nature in a new way it, are these systems really things that we can you know put into a specific perfect model that that really is competent with how nature works because nature is very complicated i mean like like we've kind of talked about with just sequestering carbon it's not as simple as soils a bucket you put carbon in it you put the lid on it and it stays in there I mean, it's much more complex than that um so i think no matter what we will always be at a this is a guesstimation based off of the best possible information we have and it's reliable to a 90 something percentile degree it's kind of just up for debate what degree that's going to be allowed and then you know what technology what certifications what verifications what registries will will dictate that right now it's 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 just a a massive kind of arms race to see who wins that battle mm -hmm. so my comment on that is years ago i had the opportunity to brief uh, vice president gore on soil carbon and of course it was talking about a lot more than what the rotan laws of the world were talking about Anyway, I got taken over to London to talk to investment groups there about soil carbon. I just was really ambivalent about getting private enterprise involved in it whatsoever. To go along a little bit with what Anthony's talking about, what, what are we doing with this and where will it go? And I knew that the, the people in the middle, the middleman would be taking most of it and the farmers wouldn't get all that much. And what happened to a small farmer in the world? So I had all of these 
Yeah, didn't know if we wanted to, to deal with this. But one of the pieces that I think really comes forward for us, and we know this regenerative movement and labeling is coming forward. And now I've, I know of three different organizations, including Gabe Brown's one of them, that are getting ready to launch a, a um, verification or a monitoring or whatever of uh, regeneration. Um, if it's outcome based, I'd say let's have a conversation. If it's if it is uh, practice based, I'd say forget it. It's sort of like the organic standards. It's it's sort of a practice based that doesn't get enforced, and there's people have to come out and check off boxes or whatever. Forget all of that because there's cheaters, and then it gets slacky in the, in the whole uh, process of trying to manage that. And special influences or profit comes in, and it starts to erode. But if it's way to be measured really cleanly, uh, then I think that will increase the value of any kind of investment that wants to go that way. That technology is coming. I've been involved with some people that out of the medical world are bringing it to the soil. And it looks like it may be fairly cost effective. Not a lot of sampling out there by people having to go out and pull the samples. And very specific on organic and inorganic carbon in the soil. And we haven't talked about that today. But the biology produces a tremendous amount of inorganic carbon, calcium carbonates, which came out of the atmosphere in those sugars to feed the biology. They multiplied, and there are some of their exudates are inorganic. Well, that carbon's still in the ground. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. and, and that often doesn't get measured in a lot of soil samples. So we need a way to um, measure it. And if we're going to pay, pay then on outcome-based, and the reason I'm a little less worried about it than I used to be is the smaller farmer, when I was leaving Africa in 2014, uh, they all had their little handies, as they're called, little flip telephones. Uh, they maybe didn't have electricity at home. They had to, to charge it at where they went to work or whatever. But they can bank by that. And if we can start to eliminate the middleman and just have direct payments into the farmer's pocket, and when I think in terms of those smallholder farmers that usually don't have enough school fees for their children, if they could get a little bit of carbon payment, I'm in. Um, but it's a, it's a, as Anthony sort of indicated, it's a complicated question. And the profiteering uh, scares me. Yeah. All right, we should probably wrap up. I got one more question that, that, that I'd like both of you to answer that might, um, might get at this kind of like uh, impediment to scale or, or, or the other way of thinking about it, which I'd, I'd rather engage with is, you know, if you can imagine, you know, uh, a policy change or some change that would, you know, really jumpstart uh, this, this transition away from uh, input intensive industrial farming towards more um, regenerative practices and, and regenerative outcomes. Um, like if it's a policy or, or some stimulus of some kind, what, what, what would you, could you imagine that would be your favorite thing? If you could snap your fingers and say, wow, if we had this, I'd, I'd really feel good about us um, cranking up the progress on this. Anthony, why don't you start there? Do you have any thoughts about that? And I was going to, I was going to pass the baton so quick and go second. On that. <laughs> um, there's, there's a lot of good answers and a lot of the people that I pointed to in my slides could give you a, a better answer than I could. I, I would actually probably swerve and say something that's a little more philosophical, which is we as a, as a people need to be more open to nuance. And what I mean by that is the first question we kind of talked about the difference between organic regenerative. Regenerative is a continuum to me, right? And really there's kind of four, there's, there's four labels, right? Conventional, organic, regenerative organic or regenerative. That's not organic, right? Um, but it is a continuum. Each operation is a continuum. And what regenerative looks like in Indiana, where I'm at, is different than what regenerative looks like in California, where Doc's at. Um, and so what, what I, the way I say all that to say is, whether it's practices based, whether it's outcomes based, whether it's, whether it's both, it's really about us as a society being a little more open to the nuance and actually being educated on biological systems and knowing what's going on versus just looking for some easy button kind of solution um, because there isn't a magic wand that's gonna that's that's gonna be the the silver bullet like it's gonna be a an array of of, of different things together. One of the things I would I would add is 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 that sometimes I've thought of policy. I've been to D.C. in the last year because they asked me to go and talk, and there's a lot of openness to legislation now for regenerative, but. It's a complex thing, and you watch that process happen in DC, and special interests come in and modify a bill. You maybe get 
get written up and then it's it's all watered down and it doesn't do what you want it to do. But I was visiting with a must be a neighbor of yours at some place, Anthony Rick Clark, who's an Indiana farmer. Yeah. If you if you know Rick, he's a great, he's great about farmer. And then his him. neighbor, Dan DeSouter, was actually Dan DeSouter I was talking to. Yeah. And Dan DeSouter had an Eisenhower fellowship with, uh, and he went to study about farmer adoption. How do they change their consciousness and move into a new way? And I was working with farmers in India because we were trying to get some of them to adopt to a no-till rice growing scenario. And we were dealing a lot with adoption theory and the university there had some great work in adoption theory. But Dan said a really important thing to me. And he said, it is this. He said, it's really about getting rid of the disincentives to change. And he said, the government has incentivized soil degradation and farming the insurance crop insurance system. And unless we pulled the plug on that, and he said, look in, in Australia where they pulled those subsidies away from farmers, they had to learn and adapt to what the environment brought to them. And they became resilient farmers. And they are no longer looking to the government and they weren't farming the government system of payment. And unfortunately, we have a lot of de-incentivizing programs set up by the farm bills of, of ages now that are based a lot for Midwest and South, not so much for California or the West, that are destructive, destructive to our soils, destructive to our regenerating them. Um, so that would maybe be the biggest thing is to cancel out the old destructive incentives yeah. and create the push towards the innovation and learning because I mean, weirdly, it seems like a lot of those incentives were meant to protect farmers, and in some ways, they have they aren't doing that either, are they? In a lot no, of ways, so they're not. Um, yeah. Well, this is fascinating. I'm sure there's so much of this we could talk about forever. And and thank you, so many of you have stayed on the call here. Um, appreciate that, and thank you both for going over a little bit, and thank you both just for participating. I'm so. Um, Honored to know both of you and happy to hear what you're up to. And I, I will definitely be checking in on you. I'm really curious about that project that you've got going, Tim, um, to, and to hear the results of that research. And so thank you both um, for your time and your expertise. Um, and to all of our audience, thank you for the time today. And uh, again, good luck with your electrification projects. And if you have questions on Anything that has to do with electrification, call me. If you need questions about regenerative <laughs> agriculture, you're going to have to ping one of these two gentlemen. But um, I'll try to pass your questions along if I can't answer them. So thank you, everyone, and hope to see you at one of our future webinars. Thank you. Thank you.